it's a very conflicted response when you make a big discovery. No sooner have you got excited, you realize there are negative ramifications for humans. And as a scientist, that's heartbreaking to see. My name is Matthew England. I'm a physical oceanographer at the University of New South Wales. There's actually some footage of me, barely one year of age, with my mum and dad at the beach, nappy on, running around. One day, I went missing for three or four hours and went across to a rock pool. Big search, police were involved. I didn't hear the loudspeaker going off, calling out my name. I was uh, too interested in the rock pool and the life in there. Just super drawn to getting in the ocean. I always dreamed of being a marine biologist, actually. When I was really young, I thought that'd be a great profession. The funny thing was, I didn't ever study biology, so I kind of missed the chance to go into that field. What I did study is maths and physics, and I didn't realise it, but that would take me on a path to understanding ocean circulation. Physical oceanography is the study of the oceans and how they circulate from the tropics to Antarctica, from the ocean surface to the sea floor. There are two big reasons why we need to understand the circulation in the oceans. One is because they're teeming with marine life, and if we don't understand how nutrients are cycled, how ocean acidification is playing out, how ocean temperatures are changing, then we can't understand the marine ecosystems that are so reliant on the conditions of the ocean. And the other big factor, and it's taking over my field actually, is that the oceans fundamentally affect our climate system. They have absorbed 93% of heat so far. So in terms of how much more our oceans can take, we need to find that out because at the moment, 93% is not without payback because the oceans expand when they warm, the sea levels rise as a result. Warmer oceans means damage to ecosystems. It means a more humid atmosphere. It means a warmer atmosphere. So that warming is not free of charge, but that 93% number, we don't know as we go into the future, whether the oceans will always be taking up 93% of that excess heat. Will it go down to 90% or even less? Those questions are really important to answer because if the oceans start absorbing a bit less heat, then that means more heat remains in the atmosphere and it means a greater pace of climate change, which means more damaging impacts on the land surface and, and a warmer climate for us as humans to endure. When I'm in the ocean swimming, I actually sometimes think about the research I'm doing. It sounds super nerdy to say that, but the oceans where I swim have a stratified layer of water. There's warm water at the surface. There's colder, saltier water beneath. After it's rained, there's often a very shallow layer of fresher water that gets colder. And so the physics of the ocean that I look at on a global scale actually plays out here at the beach. Last year I was involved in a study that documented how the oceans around the Antarctic margin are changing and how they're going to change into the future. So this Antarctic margin is an overturning circulation that starts around the rim of Antarctica but sinks to the ocean abyss and actually recirculates in the bottom two kilometres of the world's oceans. And what we found is even though that ocean circulation has been stable for thousands of years, that it is slowing down that circulation controls the uplift of nutrients in the oceans. It keeps the waters there icy cold at depth. And if we shut that circulation down or slow it down, there's going to be a warming of the Antarctic margin. So that circulation can have a what we call an amplifying or a positive feedback where the initial change leads to further ice melt. And it's what we call a tipping point of the climate system. So Antarctica has a massive slab of land ice, so ice grounded on the continent. It's got ice shelves that flow into the ocean off that land ice and sea ice. And those three components of ice all can melt and contribute meltwater into the oceans. And unfortunately, that meltwater is not dense at all. Salt water is what sinks. If we dilute that water with meltwater, it's very buoyant and it floats at the surface and it caps off that overturning circulation. So unfortunately, it's a very easy circulation to slow down and we expect it to slow down by about 40% by 2050 and head towards collapse without a reduction of emissions and not recover for thousands of years. It's not a fun field to be in because we're seeing the oceans change in costly and almost certainly irreversible ways. 
The reason our oceans matter so much for all of humanity is this fundamental control they have on our climate system and also on the marine ecosystems. Their temperatures, how salty they are, the oxygen that is required by marine life, how nutrients are cycled, they provide us with a stable climate when they're stable in their temperatures. And so it's this regulation of marine ecosystems and also our climate that make them absolutely critical to everybody on the planet. There's a big disconnect between the scientific discoveries that we're making and the rate of policy action. And I also think the broader community awareness is trying to catch up. It's just not there though, that the awareness that this shoreline here is gonna be a couple of meters above sea level rise doesn't sound like much, but on top of that, the storm surges, these coastal areas are gonna be hit by costly rates of sea level rise that could breach through five meters in a couple of hundred years. Sydney's not viable as a city at five meters of sea level rise. That might be centuries away, but nobody has built up a city around the world's coastlines expecting it to be gone in a couple of hundred years. It's very frustrating as scientists, and it's been frustrating for 30 years now to see this campaign against the science. I mean, the physics of climate change were pretty much established in the 1960s. We knew ongoing greenhouse gases would pose a real problem for climate change. So it is deeply frustrating to have the science sitting here so patently clear. The basics of climate change is actually high school physics and to have actually often elected leaders dismissing it as a non-issue. I mean, that's beyond frustrating. It makes you angry. Being an oceanographer, as our climate is changing so rapidly as a personal journey, I don't think that my kids will necessarily have much of the barrier reef. Bleaching will occur and take out that reef. And so it's a personally confronting science to be part of because we're seeing our oceans change in profound ways. And I, I know that, you know, people born today will grow up and, and really live with a different ocean to the one that I grew up with as a kid. But I guess I'm optimistic that we will solve this problem. Uh, we can get to net zero, especially here in Australia. We've got a wonderful resource in solar energy, plus wind, plus battery storage, and we can get to net zero and we can start uh, worrying about some of the adaptation we'll need to have, because unfortunately, we've locked in a couple of degrees Celsius of warming, virtually certainly, and that even that level of warming is gonna be costly to humans. Thank you.